This is Tim Murray Brown. Um, he's an artist and creative coder based in London. He works with code, sound, graphics, and interactive technology to create immersive spaces for interactive installations and live performance. So Murray Brown's work often responds to the movement of the body and draws on embodied experience, proverbial sensations of place, significance, and understanding. He looks for new contexts for human connection and creativity, places that challenge our assumptions of who we are and what we do. So I'm going to hand over to Tim now, and he will begin. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Hi, so as Afra mentioned, um, pretty much all of the work I make is kind of surrounded uh, immersed in this idea of making interactive experiences. And uh, I sort of take just a very broad view of that as some kind of media or space that's going to respond in terms of how you act. And I'm going to talk just about one work mostly today, I think, because it's quite nice to just go into a bit of detail about it. And I will start just with a quick showreel to kind of give an overview and then talk about it. That's like everything in one minute. But the work I want to talk to you about today is Cave of Sounds, which I've, I've actually just come from a plane today from Athens where we were showing the kind of finished version of this work. And it's a piece that's been going on for the last six years or so. And it's the first public thing. So it's really fresh in my mind. And um, I'm really sort of interested to share some of the ideas and journey that's gone into it. And so I, actually as my undergraduate, I studied maths and computer science, and that's kind of how I uh, sort of learned coding and that aspect of things. And after that, I did a PhD on interactive music systems at Queen Mary. And um, I think the kind of one of the sort of experiences that kind of fed into this was my um, own sort of musical journey. So I'm not really a performing musician, but I sort of make music and I enjoy music. And when I was at university, I got involved in a kind of free improvisation group where we would just go to, say, a studio or a music space uh, or an auditorium with a few instruments and just kind of play for four hours, five hours without talking, without any kind of structure or anything, and just get into this meditative space where we were really connected to each other. And I found that totally mind-blowing when I first discovered it. Um, and I sort of made a really strong connection to the people I was doing it with. So when I was doing my PhD and I wanted to look at interactive music, and like particularly with interactive sound installations, and I kind of had this issue that I sort of had this vision in my head of what I wanted to experience, and I never really found it anywhere. I could never really involve myself in a lot of the work, which I came across, or I did involve myself, but just not quite to the uh, immersion that I was looking for. So I kind of made the topic of my PhD sort of how can I make interactive music more captivating, which is a really broad topic for a PhD, and it was like quite complicated to actually make that work with the process. Um, but it took me down a lot of interesting routes, and one of the sort of questions I really found myself coming up against is, what is music? And like, why do we do it, and why do we enjoy it? And it's a really huge question that goes into lots of different disciplines, and that there are loads of different 
people trying to answer this question from different perspectives. So some researchers sort of putting people in MRI scanners when they listen to music and looking at which parts of the brain light up and trying to reason about the pleasure of the experience from that. And other people sort of taking musical scores and doing a statistical analysis on it and coming up with theories about sort of probability and expectation. Um, one of the things that really sort of grabbed my attention was this kind of more anthropological perspective on it. And there was a writer called Christopher Small who had a book, Musicking, where he kind of really deconstructed what goes on in some kind of musical ritual or musical event, be it, say, uh, going to a classical concert or uh, just walking down the street listening to your iPod and all of these things. And um, yeah, so Small's perspective, he's, he's a bit of a controversial figure because he's one of these people that sort of has one idea and like makes everything about that idea. But uh, what he really focuses on is the kind of social event that's happening. So when we go to a nightclub or when we go to a concert, what's going on between the people? Like, what is this kind of collective activity going on? Who is deciding what happens here? And how does that reflect on us as people at the event? And he goes a bit further and sort of argues that all the kind of musical practices we do are a kind of celebration or reinforcement of the kind of society that we live in. And I think that's, I think it is a little overstated, but it's a perspective that kind of really shifted how I looked at a lot of music and musical events. So to give you an example, this is a kind of big rock concert <coughs> in a big stadium with thousands and thousands of people. And this is an illegal rave in South London, I think from last year or a couple of years ago. And this is an Irish folk session in a pub. And in the kind of folk session, anyone can turn up with an instrument and play. Um, but you can't display anything. You play a very sort of established body of music. And you can't really play badly without getting a bit of stick from people. It's not like a sort of anyone can do anything environment. It's like if you're not playing well, then you'll hear about it. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I guess I chose these examples because you kind of, to me originally, I think I kind of saw these two as kind of modern contemporary music, how we kind of live life in mainstream culture today. And this is a kind of traditional artifact or something, you know, it's like a tradition that's been carried on and people are preserving. But when you take this kind of other question, which is, what, are the, what is the sort of social order that's going on here? Where are the decisions being made? And how does this sort of reflect a kind of relationship or a way society could be constructed? And in the folk session here, you've got a very sort of open community space. And the way this event pans out is kind of determined just by tradition, but also just by the decisions of everybody around. And the other people in the pub are talking whilst it happens. And there's some really beautiful recordings of folk sessions from like the 60s where you can hear everybody like shouting every now and then in the pub, just completely ignoring this music, which someone has taken the time to record and you can now get it to CD and listen to over and over again. And it's really beautiful. And it's, it's uh, these people are probably friends as well from playing this music together. And if you have considered the rave, then there's something very special going on here as well, because there's no, nobody's looking at the DJ. Probably they don't know where the music is coming from, and they most likely don't really consider the person outputting the music into this sound system as the person who's making this event happen, or necessarily the reason they're there. The reason people are here is because everybody else is here, and there is a sense of total chaos here, and that's kind of part of the fun, it's the anarchy of it. And the fact that it's illegal as well is also part of what is going on in the musical world. If it was a ticketed event with all of that sort of institutionalization around it, then it wouldn't really feel the same. And then you get the rock concert, and from this frame, this is to me like a kind of religious ceremony where everybody is worshipping a single person on the stage. 
but furthermore, it's almost like this kind of institutionalized hierarchy that is here. There is so much organization and regulation that goes into this. It's so complicated to put that many people into a space without people dying as a result. And people have amazing experiences at these as well. And to kind of call this like an institutionalized hierarchy, it sounds a bit bad, but it does make things possible as well. You know, you just, uh, you can get a level of production that's phenomenal and you can feel a weight of power when you're in an audience that size with an amazing performer in front of you. Now, it really does take you somewhere totally different from sitting in the pub playing music with your mates. Um, but then if you think like, okay, um, if I was gonna send my kid to a school and one of these three was the school, like which one are you gonna send them to? Probably this one, I guess. But then if there's a war coming and we need an army, which is gonna be your army? It's not gonna be these guys. And it's probably not gonna be these guys. It's gonna be these guys. And each of these kind of different practices, they kind of have their way, you know, they have their place in our society in a way. Um, and sometimes they kind of show things that maybe are a bit ugly, but are kind of necessary, or they show things that kind of impress us in a way that we maybe aren't so comfortable with, like being impressed by power or order or things like that. So anyway, these kind of like ideas we're feeding in when I saw this film, uh, The Cave of Forgotten Dreams by Werner Herzog where he kind of, it's all just about cave paintings in France going back 30,000, 60,000 years ago. And it also includes musical instruments that have been found, like a flute that's 100,000 years old that was discovered like among the same area. And this like linked together along with some of the small ideas and small borrows from this philosopher Bateson who talks about dance and music as this kind of abstract space where you can explore relationships and do things that maybe you can't do in the normal life and kind of use it to just sort of test things out and try things out without having real consequences. Like you can dance with people in a way that's quite provocative that you wouldn't really be able to do in normal life and kind of just get a sense of like, okay, what's going on here without actually putting yourself on the line and having to deal with the consequences and you can go a bit crazy and you can show off and you can feel just part of a group and all of these things. And I just had this image of people in caves 60,000 years ago um, using music as a way to kind of forge this very first kind of human society where we develop this ability to be out, say, hunting, as we always imagine the cliches of cave people, like hunting animals or fighting other cave people, but in a way where they're so connected with each other that they just understand what's going on. They understand when someone's going to step forwards or someone's going to step back, and when someone can take a role of leadership because they're actually in some kind of space of shared consciousness where you don't need to say things. You just understand what everyone else is doing. And that is something that we get through music. So the Cave of Sounds is the piece that came out of this. And um, all of the media, because I've just come back from Athens showing it, all the media I have is from last week. And it's all really, well, the videos are really rough and they're just like phone videos because we're still processing it. But anyway, the project started in 2012. And the piece itself is a sound installation, an interactive installation with eight different musical instruments. And they're all arranged in a circle and they all face inwards. And each instrument was made by a different person, like a different artist as part of this process of creating an ensemble together. So every instrument's got its own personality and its own an individual's take on what it means to make music in a different way. And as an exhibition, it's just put in a space and visitors to the space are invited to come and play with very minimal instruction. Like each instrument has got about four or five words just to kind of get you started on it. And then we just kind of see what people do and how it pans out. And there were eight artists who made the instruments and then over the time the team has grown a bit with like uh, other people helping on the production and the set. And there's a really sort of nice parallel story that I could tell about the process of creation because uh, there's a lot of really amazing lessons that came out of that. 
but in the sort of topic of social sculpture, I want to just talk about the audience experience and what we feel or what I think happens when people experience this work and what we want to happen. So one theme guiding us throughout this piece was sort of right from the start, it's like the idea of making instruments that are intuitive without you needing to necessarily be a musician. Um, so that is partly so that everyone can come and enjoy it. But it's also to kind of like tap into this idea of music as a, not as a specialist activity and not as something that is made by specialists and then consumed by an audience, but it's just something that we can all tap into straight away. And interestingly, when, with these instruments, when you do actually get very, very trained musicians, in my experience, they tend not to like them very much because they sort of have lost a bit of control over it. Um, so they're all sort of quite, they're not simple instruments, but they've all got a very sort of easy entry point. And some of them are much more complex than others, but each of them has quite a lot of depth to it. It's not like something that pretends to, ma pretends to make you a musician and creates music whilst you kind of just fuck around with something. It's like, it's just a very sort of distilled idea of, okay, this is, this piece here you can see on the screen is a drone and there's a lamp swinging and there's 24 sensors, light sensors underneath. And it's a single 50 hertz uh, fundamental frequency and every single sensor controls a different harmonic of that. So as you go right down to the, to the bottom, you hear the bass sounds and you can get this huge like, range of timbres on the instrument. You can't control the note, you can just control the timbre and that's what that instrument does. And this is the one that I made and it's a flute that you play with your arms. So it just responds to the movement of the body. And it kind of, you don't get to see this, but in sort of the virtual space where the, where the controls are defined, you have a cylinder of notes around you and you can just put your hand into a different note. And the instructions underneath are move your arms like a bird. So the first thing people do is this, and they just hit a few notes. And so all of these instruments are also kind of networked together in a way. I mean, inside that, that octagon is the center is really big and it's full of um, kit doing things. And uh, when lots of people come together, there is a sort of central program which sends out signals that might change the key or change the harmony. So everything changes together and responds to the overall dynamics of the space. And so one of the kind of things we were trying to explore with this is this feeling of creating music together. And in particular, for me, the feeling of improvising with people without any structure, without any rules, and that feeling of connection that you get with them. And it's not just about, oh, here we are connecting with people. It's connecting with people whilst you're really exploring yourself creatively. You're really putting things out that you have no quality control over necessarily, and just letting that happen in front of these people. And that is like quite a profound way to connect with people. And another thing which I really like, and I mean, for me this is quite significant, but I haven't quite figured it out yet. But it's, it's a piece that seems to like work across all different age spans. So we have a lot of kids come and play with it and enjoy it. And sometimes kids come with their parents and when their parents are there, sometimes the parents will just focus on the children and really focus on the experience the children are happening. And then it gets a bit later and there's a bar open and people come with a drink and older people come and it's just the same piece for them as well. So my favorite time is in the evening. And I should say this is like an endless soundscape going on as well. So I've been hearing it for 12 hours a day for five days. And when I like go to bed now, I still hear it at the moment. And just seeing a picture, like I, and it, it's like, it's not like you have a song stuck in your head. It's like you have an, a, an ambience of all these different sounds in my head. I'll play you a little clip here. Um, yeah, it ranges from like, loads of people there, loads of noise, like feelings of absolute chaos to just a few people. And there was a really beautiful moment I, I found and I had to, we haven't done the child consent yet, so I had to like cut the video really short whilst we work out all of the 
stuff, but I'll show you this little bit here for my toes. So when, um, so we've, this is like a kind of new build of the piece. The original we first showed in 2013 and we took it around the world and it was so complicated and flaky that I tried to avoid any ever showing it unless someone had like lots of money. Um, so we built this, we built this new one last year, which was kind of like the finishing of the project in a way where we built a proper set for it and we redid all the software so that it doesn't crash every five minutes and all of these kind of logistical things. Um, and throughout the sort of exhibiting it, I always had this idea that I really wanted people to start jamming together and to look at each other. And I had this idea that the sort of the perfect moment would be when people are playing in their own space and then they suddenly look up and then they start playing with someone else and then it turns into this kind of more sort of connected jam. And it was just last week that, because I was playing on it quite a lot, and I just realized that I never do that when I play it. As soon as I get to an instrument, and my favorite one is the one that's just on the left there where you cast shadows with your hands to make different kinds of sounds. And I would just love to just lose myself in it because it's, I know the guy who made it, and I know how much, how many sort of hidden sounds and hidden features there are in it, and you get better and better at finding them. And the thing that kind of struck me when I was doing that and not looking at people was that that was actually exactly what I was looking for anyway. And I was just thinking back to being in a big auditorium with some friends sort of 10 years earlier, like making different sounds, and we didn't look at each other, we didn't talk to each other, we just listened and shared a space and made sounds together. And if you're musicians doing this, then you will kind of respond to the rhythms of each other and you will like pick up melodies of each other, which is kind of taken care of a little bit here. But the thing that kind of I was found interesting is that when there's nobody in the space and you go up to an instrument and you make some sounds, it feels so different than if there's a stranger on the other side making sounds as well. And the sounds that you're both making are not conflicting with each other. They're both just adding to this continual soundscape going on. And I was just trying to think of a parallel, and it's a little bit like being in an empty restaurant having dinner versus being in a restaurant with lots of people, and you don't talk to these people, and uh, you don't want them to listen to your conversation, and yet they're really important for you to feel like you can relax and talk to someone. And if you're in an empty restaurant talking, it's quite, it's a very different experience. There's just something about that collective energy of what's going on. And there's, yeah, there's one other thing to add to this as well, which is about the fact that all of these instruments are completely new in a way. They've all been made bespoke. Um, some draw on different ideas that have existed before. But one of the consequences of that is that there are no kind of experts who have established how these things should play, be played. And in a sense, it kind of puts everybody down to the beginner level. And I think there's something quite liberating about that in the sense that if you don't play piano and you see a piano, you can have so much fun with it, except for the fact that you know you're really shit at the piano. And if anyone heard you, they'd be like, oh, you think you can play piano, do you? I've heard you play piano. Which is just total bullshit because um, that's, that's just like a kind of conditioned response that we've gradually developed. And if you see a child with a piano, you'll realize like, no, there's actually some amazing stuff that you can do just with this fantastic tool here. 
Um, so uh, this kind of lack of experts, and it also kind of, for me, can expect to this idea of prehistoric music, where, and I, I'm not an anthropologist, I just imagine stuff and make it up, but I find it really inspiring to do it. And just this idea of sort of people sitting around a fire in a circle making sounds and kind of discovering what sounds they can make, but also like as music as a way to kind of explore technology and taking a really sort of broad sense of what technology means. So technology as social organization or as um, new ways to make sound or to hit things together or a flute. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's that, it's that spirit of like curiosity and play and excitement rather than the spirit of specialism and industry and um, making something for yourself and being successful. Um, I have a little time lapse because it's social sculpture night. Uh, these are the volunteers from the festival at a moment when it was quite quiet. Is like had heard so much of it and still a lot sick of it and going to have some fun. Okay, so I I was originally going to talk about two works and then when I wrote actually put the slides together I realised that I would just talk for way too long and it's been 26 minutes. But I thought uh, rather than cut it short I would just like give you a complete tease by showing you the slides and telling you nothing about them. <laughs> because I really like this juxtaposition of four slides and there is a great story and you'll have to have me back if you want to hear it. <laughs> series and they were so good. What you've been up to. Um, actually, I've, 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 I was lucky enough to experience your Cave of Sound uh, piece uh, when you um, exhibited at the Somerset, Somerset House. And I'm, yeah, and I can say I totally got in, you know, really immersed in it. You were, you were also there? We were there together and we oh, yeah? came there. Well, uh, time ago. Very first one. Oh, yeah, the very, very first one. Yeah, the one in Barbican. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's fascinating to see the evolution, and, and I, I, I really enjoy to hear the background of your interest with about sound, and I would like you know the, where the community you know of people are you know enjoying sounds and playing sounds. Uh, I think that's fascinating, and it's something that um, in our culture is very driven. Like everyone, you know, it's one of the th one of almost one of the common things that everyone has. They will always like music, any kind, you know, different kind of music, but sound. So. So yeah, that was really fascinating. I don't know if anyone has uh, any question that you want to throw. Yeah, let me know. <laughs> Hi, um, I absolutely loved your talk. Uh, amazed at your work and admire how you think. Uh, this might be a strange question, but I would love to hear what, uh, what, what somebody like you would say. Uh, why do whales sing? That's a really fun question. <laughs> Mm. 
So I, ha I have this like my little theory about how we hear sound, and I have a feeling that as humans we're really really attuned to hear agency in sound. So we're very what, what? agency, so like intention or the thing. So when we hear rustling in the trees, if it's an animal, like there's something about the quality of the sound an animal makes is just instantly different from the wind in the trees. And if it's a person, um, they will sound like an animal, but then a person can just make one kind of sound that's different, which I think is like... And that's, there's something about the quality of that rhythm, or there's something about it which to me feels really human. And there's a track I know, which is, it's just a drummer with some glass and drums, and it sounds like an animal, and so he just does one little thing, and then it's like, oh my god, it's a drummer. And so when it comes to animal sounds, I don't really know, because they always just seem to be mating calls, um, I, I believe, or like signals. But there is one thing actually which is quite interesting, which is, comes back to the, the ideas of Bateson that Christopher Small writes about. And he sort of talks about this idea of gesture and interspecies communication. So how different animals can communicate with other species of animal just using their body. And that's actually a more direct way of communicating than through sound. So when we hear, say, a lion or a dog or something, then we can understand a lot of the emotion in the sound. And in a sense, like we don't really know if that's like we've all evolved on this planet together and we've all evolved this system of like, this is what panic sounds like, this is what uh, like happiness sounds like, or whether it's just this kind of like the physicality of it, you know, it's like if you're doing something with a lot of energy, then you're showing strength. Um, but in terms of why whales sing, <laughs> so yeah, so the connection with those two things is like, I really generally like to think of humans as animals and animals as kind of being more than just like a human with all of the good bits taken away. And uh, I would like to think that when whales sing, they're kind of doing something communal about it. But I wouldn't like go as far as making assumptions or say that it's music or something. But in terms of the fact that all of the sounds we hear, we kind of can attribute to a source, um, and particularly animal sounds, then I would think that if you're this species that's living huge distances away and uh, you need to sort of have friends or you need to find a mate and it's not as simple as saying oh look I'm here come and get me I've got a beautiful song but it's also like just maintaining that continuity of awareness of who's around just like and you can't really see people or see other whales because they're really far away anyway nice question <laughs> Um, anyone else? Yes? Hi. Hi. Um, so my background is um, based on movement as well, but it's, also, it's around sort of movement and conversation. So I was really interested to hear what you had to say about um, the sort of the gestural um, communication between the, the people around the sphere. And in particular, there was one person who was moving a lot, so the person controlling the flute, was it? Yeah. Um, and so they were sort of waving their arms around. And um, from what I know about um, communication is that if you're moving a lot, you're attracting a lot of attention, and you're sort of saying, I'm speaking now, or this is, I want to speak now, or you're trying to take the, the role or whatever. Um, so I was just wondering whether in the social organization of, of this piece, whether you noticed there was any sort of structure based on um, people's movement and the qualities of that. Mm. I think that the normal way that people move through this piece, particularly if there's quite a few people around, is they will go one by one through all the instruments. And often they'll sort of, when they've already been around, they'll see someone else do something they didn't do themselves or they didn't see that was possible and so they'll carry on and continue like that. And the flute, so the intention when I was designing the flute was I just wanted to be able to do this kind of dance thing and get a little 
melody come out of it. And so that kind of desire for sort of expressive movement was in there right from the beginning. And when people come to it, and uh, like, it sort of is a really exposing instrument, partly because the instructions are move your arms like a bird, uh, partly because, uh, I should say, there was a glitch on it as well, so it wasn't working for the first three days, like 100%, so sometimes it wouldn't work, and sometimes it would. And it's funny that it's that instrument that did that, because it's really, just doing, just telling someone to move your arms like a bird is quite a vulnerable thing to get someone to do, particularly if you're a bit of a shy person. Um, but then when it does work, and you get that sound, then it kind of liberates you, in a way, as in, you've done this kind of silly thing, but now it's an instrument, you're getting sound out of it. And the thing I really want to kind of get from that is to give people that freedom to move, in a way, and to be the person who's doing this kind of movement, like, uh, whilst everyone else is maybe a bit more focused on something. And whilst we were, so last week we were at a science festival in Athens, and for the mornings they just sent school party after school party through it. And uh, it was really interesting to see, um, particularly with the flute, because it was like a total show off instrument. And so, say if you've got like a 13 year old boy on it, in a, in, with all of his classmates around, and uh, one of the volunteers we had was doing this process of getting everyone to go one by one so we could hear what the different instruments sound like by themselves. And it's just like, whoever was on that instrument, like, as soon as they did something, everyone would laugh afterwards. And it would be an opportunity for, like, a kind of sort of show off your person to kind of make a bit of a thing of it, um, or to kind of just try something and then sort of retreat. And the person on it would always laugh at themselves as well, which is it's not like everyone's laughing at them, it's like, they've been put into this role where, in this particular context, this is going to be something funny and something quite exposing. And, and did the person doing all the movements sort of almost guide the other the people doing it with the other instruments? No. No. No, and it really, depends on, it really depends on how many people are there, though. So there was a moment where, and I missed this, but Anastasia, who was the other crew, saw it and was telling it to me, where there was two women on there, and one was on the flute and one was on the opposite one wearing the mask. And she said that they were kind of talking through their movements. So they would sort of start to say words and then have a conversation, but like make the music happen with it as well. And these kind of things. But when it's just like in this kind of haze of sound, when there's say, I mean, there were too many people a lot of the time, um, but it's really fun when that happens. Uh, there is like, you kind of, lose, you lose like any leader in it, or you do have this influence, but for me, in that kind of context, the influence is more into the collective space, and then that, whatever you want to get into that collective space, rather than necessarily sort of thinking, okay, that person's going for something, now I'm going to follow it. Um, but that is just down, a lot of that is down to the number of people, the space itself, the light, like if people have had a drink, if they know the people around. Um, and also this version of the installation, this new version, where it's actually really big, and you've been put a little bit further away than you were before from the people, and these all have a subtle effect on it. Uh, just the last question. It's more, about, more of an observation rather than a criticism, but why, why the use of written instruction? It's it, there's so much debate. <laughs> it's, it's, more, it's more just that we, you know, by having a written instruction, it's, two-part question is all about where is the where for you is the first point of interaction because if you have a written you know I think I think what's amazing is that you have these you know you have all of these instruments in the space and I think there's something which can be gained from just that serendipity of having all these people in the room just trying to learn from each other so mm -hmm. yeah I'm just curious to know what what, what what the reason is whether it's just for I'm totally with you and I that's actually what we had in mind at the beginning and we eventually realized that so many people just could not get that first step into it. It's like, we just needed to give them something to give them permission to do something. And then once you've got something coming out of it, then you can explore. Because we really want people to explore. It's an experience of not being told what to do and of doing that. So the instructions themselves, we've kind of chosen to be things that 
um, will cause something to happen, but won't actually tell you where to go from there. I mean, can't frustration be part of the process? <laughs> because you know, with, with a lot of interactive works, it's all, you know, there's often this sort of perhaps didactic approach about having a some kind of end game of having a, a, a reward for an action. So I mean, it's perhaps sometimes that you know something is kind of challenging you in that way, where it's not telling you what to do, can also be can also be good. For, you know, can also be not good. It's maybe not the right word, but it can also yeah, be good. I I do I do totally agree with that, and I I think. The thing is, is that we just have we just have to test it lots and lots and lots and balance the frustration with the sort of accessibility and all of these things. And there is still, yeah, there is there are still moments of frustration in there as well, um, which you get when particularly. So the one with the shadows, like there are pictures of a few example shadows, and it says cast shadows with your hand. And so you can do this and make the sound of a dog, you can make the sound of a wolf, you can make the sound of a bird. But the thing is, if you do this shape and you move your hand up and down and around it, you have a full synthesizer. And if you make your hand wider, it gives you FM modulation. And then if you do this other flip, then it changes the mode and you get a different synthesizer. And it's all this kind of hidden stuff in there that people kind of accidentally find. And often with that instrument, for example, someone will do that and then someone else will come along and try to like figure out how did that happen? How did that work? And there is that kind of moment of like serendipity and frustration. Yet, there is also this kind of sort of uh, ideological need to create a space where people don't feel isolated or excluded by not being the one, the inside group, who knows what's going on. And with this kind of interactive work, I think without the instructions, that does kind of happen a bit. Particularly if you walk in, lots of people are doing stuff, and you're told, yeah, just go ahead and do it. You don't really know like, if this is just a group of like hipsters who do this every week, and you're just like this person who's wandered in, and uh, there's this way of doing it. And so it is just like the balance. And yeah, and I totally like the critique, because that is something that we've really, it's really, hard to get the trade-off on that. <laughs>